Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, wherever you are. I'm Steve Cantrell. I'm the director of the Institute of the Mathematical Sciences here of the Americas here at the University of Miami. And so it's, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the second of our first uh, distinguished colloquium series for our consortium. And it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mina Teicher, a member of our uh, Scientific Advisory Committee, who will be chairing this morning's session. Mina. Good morning. Uh, it's a great uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Professor uh, Don Zaglier. He, I mean, not only because of being one of the greatest uh, number theorists of the 20th century and the 21st century, but due also to his uh, influence on many other fields of uh, mathematics. I mean, he is really unique in the, in the way that uh, he sees how, he sees how uh, number theory and his knowledge is connected to any other, any other field of mathematics that he can do mathematics in the middle of the night or in a boat or, or on, a, on a mountain and he's concentrated on mathematics everywhere. And thirdly, that he knows how to connect, uh, to connect and talk to people. So the, at the end, the, we have a great mathematician with a great uh, influence. And I, I will not describe everything that uh, he contributed in the last, uh, during his career. Uh, Phil Griffiths that introduced his, him on the, for the first talk uh, uh, did it uh, beautifully. Uh, I just uh, wanted to add, uh, just wanted to describe these three very big uh, uh, qualities on, on, uh, on the image of, of a number, on concentration and on collaboration that together with that, this uh, gave this amazing uh, influence. So Don, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mina. I don't remember when I've had such an exaggerated amount of praise. The only thing that is definitely true is that I sometimes do mathematics in the middle of the night. But <laughs> uh, I'm not so sure about all the rest, but it would be nice to think so. So I'm very happy to be here again. I'm going to start uh, by reviewing a little bit, so maybe the first quarter of today's lecture, in this somewhat different terms, what I did in the first lecture. First of all, I've been told by a few people, actually by hundreds of people, that I talk too fast. And so you probably missed a lot, even if you were there. And many people couldn't make the first lecture, didn't know about it. So I'm going to summarize a little bit the main directions, but presenting it differently from the way I did before. So as you know, the, the pair of lectures is called from knots to number theory. I'm more a number theorist, and today I want to start the other way with number theory. So there were two, I mentioned many things last time that are number theory, like zeta functions, but there were two that are especially important to me and that are not so familiar to a wide group of people, even number theorists, not always, and certainly people outside. So on the number theory side, I want to emphasize two main things. The block group, which I explained last time, I'll repeat again, but more briefly. So B is for block, F is for field. So this, for us, it'll be a number field. It could, in principle, be any field. And the other is the Habira ring, uh, which is a very, very beautiful object, which somehow only topologists usually know, a few number theorists. And, uh, Part of what came out of this work, in particular in joint work with Stavros and uh, Peter Scholze, is that this Habira ring is actually just H sub Q. And there are much more complicated Habira rings for every number field, which are no longer just one object, but they're graded. So there's an index, and the index is an element of this block group, which for Q is trivial. So it has a new structure, but I won't be able to go into that. So here I'll say, uh, here I'll say SG, and here I'll say SG and to, uh, but I won't talk about that, those things today, but I certainly want to mention Peter Schultz. And another part that I probably won't get to is with Renat Kashaev. And I remind you from last time, the main collaborator and everything I'm telling is uh, joint work with Stavros Garofalidis. 
who's now in SUSTEC, University of, uh, Southern University of Science Technology in Shenzhen. And uh, the paper, in some sense, we finished it today. Many people ask me when it's finally going to be ready. We'll only put it on the upload to the archive in maybe a week, but we'll send out copies today to people in the field, including many who are at this lecture, and wait for a week to catch typos and make a few last minute improvements. But at least the, so what I'm talking about, there will be a, a written source soon. And also I mentioned last time I gave a course uh, three months ago, and that's online on the Max Planck Institute, both recorded lectures and a fair number of notes. So if you're interested in some part, you can look. So let me start with, with the number theory. So the block group, uh, is, divide, is a certain set divided by, well, a group divided by another group. So A of F, I explained last time, these are formal integer combinations of elements of the field. So let's say some N, I, Z, I, it's finite. I goes from somewhere to somewhere. These are integers. These are elements of the field. So that would be, if I just had that, that would be Z of F, but I don't want them all. I want with a special property. And to, so I'll say it first the way I did it last time, such that the sum over i of ni times the determinant of the two by two matrix if you take any two homomorphisms. from the multiplicative group of the field to Z. So for instance, if it were Q, that might be the valuation at some prime. Then you can make this two by two determinant. And if you add them all up with these weights, you should get zero. So there's an actually somewhat fancier way to say that, which is actually once you get used to it, much easier. It means you take Z of F and you have a map to this uh, exterior wedge of F cross. And the map sends any generator Z to Z wedge one minus Z. And this is very confusing if you don't know it, you can forget it, but it just means the wedge is a formal symbol which satisfies that it's linear. So if you take X wedge Y1, Y2, it's, it's linear in the sense of the multiplicative group because it's S cross. This would be the sum and secondly, X wedge Y plus Y wedge X is zero. So it's anti-symmetric. So that's exactly equivalent to that if you think about it a bit and C of F, is the span of the, of the so-called five term relation. And that's a very, very beautiful thing, which goes back actually to the beginning of the 19th century. So it's now 200 years old. So let me tell you what the five term relation is. So here's the theorem I like to call the easiest theorem of mathematics, meaning that there are even easier statements that are completely trivial, but they're not interesting. I wouldn't call them theorems. They're just a, an identity or an exercise. But this is really a deep theorem in the sense that it's trivial to prove, but has many, many uh, ramifications in a huge number of fields of mathematics that I won't list. And the theorem is this. If you have a collection of numbers in some field, so Z, Z, N, let's say different from zero, uh, for N is, you know, N is an integer. And if they satisfy the following recursion, that each Z, Z N, if you take its one complement, one minus Z, N, this will be the product of the two neighbors. So it's a doubly infinite sequence. And from this, you can work out the sequence in both directions. And the theorem is that then it automatically has period five. So then you get a collection of five numbers, Z1, well, like any five successive ones, but for instance, Z1 plus Z5, that could be this element. I usually use Xi generically for this, uh, uh, here it is, psi is such an element that satisfies this condition. And now you see that if I compute this D of psi, which sends each C to Z wedge one minus C, let's do it. Then you see that D of psi is the sum of N modulo five, because it's periodic by the easiest theorem. And then I'll have Z N wedge one minus Z N, but Z N is Z N minus one times Z N plus one, because that's the defining relation. But because the wedge is additive, this is the sum Zn wedge Zn minus one, n mod five. And the other term similarly is the sum Zn wedge Zn plus one. 
But now you see that since this is periodic, it doesn't matter if it's n and n plus one or n minus one and n, I can shift the index by one. And then I would have z n minus one wedge z n, which is the opposite of this. And my symbol is anti-symmetric. And so this is zero. So that's the very short proof that these special relations are in this kernel of D, so they're in A. And if you take arbitrary linear combinations of them, we throw that away. It's exactly like homology. A homology group is cycles modulo boundaries, or homology co cycles modulo co boundaries. So this is the block group. It looks very abstract, and it is a bit abstract, but it's absolutely comprehensible and calculatable in any given case. And I'll talk about that, and you can write down elements easily. And the other thing, is that you have the so-called regulator map if the field is C. But we'll be looking at number fields, but every number field can be embedded into C in as many ways as the degree. So the B of F will map to B of C, and then I can take this regulator, it's usually called D, to map to the real numbers, and it simply sends the sum of ZI satisfying this famous condition. I can put the ends, I'll just drop them. It sends them to the sum of D of ZI and D of Z I wrote out the form last time, maybe I won't bother. It's the bloch wigner die logarithm. It's a completely explicit function programmed on many computers. It's like arctangent. It's just a fixed function uh, called the bloch wigner die logarithm. Very simple to compute. And then the point of this function, d of z, is that it was discovered in the early 19th century uh, about by five different people independently, Spence and Abel and Lobachevsky and several other people later, they discovered that if you have five numbers related in this way, then the sum of the five values of z is, of d is always zero. And that means that d vanishes on the group I'm dividing by for the complex numbers. And that means that this becomes a well-defined function on the block group. Okay, so, so much for the block group. Now the Habira ring. The Habira ring, h, has as elements things that I write as a of q, where Q sometimes will be written as e to the two pi times something else. Sometimes it, it won't. But these are not functions, as I emphasized last time. It's not functions on the complex numbers. A priori, if you put for Q some complex number like two, it won't make any sense. But what it is, is let me see how I wrote it. So the, the Habir ring formally is this limit. Now I'm going to use slightly fancier notation than last time. It's the inverse limit of the ring of Laurent polynomials in Q with coefficients in Z modulo QN. And I remind you that X semicolon QN, just the Pochhammer symbol, is one minus X times one minus QX all the way up to one minus Q to the N minus one X. And if I don't put two arguments, QN always means you just repeat the argument QQN. Okay, so it's one minus Q times one minus Q squared up to one minus Q to the N. So this again looks abstract, but what it means is for instance, if A is in an H and if Zeta is a root of unity, then even though I said you can't evaluate A of points, you can evaluate it at that point and you'll get an actual number in Z of Zeta. And I explained that last time, this is a limit of polynomials but after a while, those polynomials differ by multiples of the nth Pochhammer symbol. But if Zeta is a fifth root of unity, let's say, then this Pochhammer symbol, one minus Q, one minus Q squared, up to one minus Q to the N, will vanish for all N equal or bigger, bigger than or equal to five. And so the, the thing will simply converge. So we have something given by a sequence of polynomials, but that sequence will stabilize. It will just be constant from some point on for any root of unity. And therefore we get a map from H into the map, usually we write mu infinity for the set of roots of unity into actually Q bar, because this is an algebraic number. And that map is injective. That's not at all obvious. So even though I'm only telling you the value of A at all roots of unity, think of this on unit circle, you know, the, the rational points, but in fact, you can get the whole function back. But if you have A and H, then you also can take A infinitesimally, I always use E to the minus H near the origin. And then for the same reason, this will make sense as a power series in H with rational coefficients, because you approximate this by sequence of polynomials. And after a while, two polynomials differ by this Pochhammer symbol where a multiple of this, where N is very big. But each of these terms is divisible by H. 
because if Q is one, there's zero. And so that term is divisible by H to the N. And therefore to any given order like H to the 10th, the, the, the series will simply stabilize. So each coefficient of these, uh, this expansion will stabilize to a number. And in fact, you can do it even better. If I don't use E to the minus H, but if I use one plus H, where H is still in class, so of course it's still in Q of epsilon, that would be the same. But actually now it's even a power series with integer coefficients. And the reason is clear because the original polynomial had integer coefficients. So each polynomial does, and the value is stabilized modular any power of epsilon. So that means that we also have a map into Z of epsilon. So power series with integer coefficients. And this map is also injective. So you can recognize a Habira element either by its power series expansion around one point, one, or its values without a power series at all points. But actually you can combine it if zeta is any root of unity, then you have a value, and this will now be in Z of zeta, double bracket H. So you have a bunch of power series, but already these special cases are enough. And maybe I won't say why it's enough unless there's a question at the end if somebody wants to ask uh, in one line why you have this injectivity, how you go between these things. That's a very beautiful idea. It uses piadic congruences of these things, or just congruences modulo uh, P, uh, just P is enough. Was found by Otsky uh, quite a few years ago. And so that tells you that from the nature of these coefficients multiple P and the nature of this at roots of unity, P through roots of unity, you can go back and forth. Okay, so that's now the number theory. And now I assume that I have a knot and I want to uh, remind you, I've been passed on a bit. So now I have topology, so I have either three manifolds or in our case, it will mostly be, well, the first thing I say is for all three methods, the decks will be not complements, not K, so M would be the complement. And so now I claim that for any M, it doesn't have to be a not complement. I will get an element. Well, first of all, I'll get a field and then a number field. Actually, it's a product of several number fields. I don't want, I mentioned just last time a little, I'm not going to repeat that. And an element, so this is Fm if you want, and an element which also depends on M in the block group of this field. So that's one of the things that automatically is just given to you when you have a knot or a three manifold, you get an, some number field or sometimes a product of fields and elements of their block groups. And how does this work? So the basic fact is this, if you have let delta be a tetrahedron, so, but it's a hyperbolic tetrahedron. So that means in one of the standard models, you can think of the vertices as, you know, somewhere in the upper half plane and it looks, you know, it, it doesn't look very Euclidean, but actually it's an ideal hyperbolic uh, tetrahedron, which means all of the vertices are at infinity. And infinity, the boundary of hyperbolic three space is the uh, Riemann sphere, it's the complex line at the point at infinity. And then you can always, and essentially uniquely once you've numbered the vertices, you can put one vertex at zero, one vertex at one, one at Z, which is some complex number. Uh, sorry, I don't want those sides. And one at infinity, so I can always make the vertices. If I didn't do that, I would have four vertices, P1, P2, P3, P4, they would have cross ratio. And that cross ratio is this number Z. So the whole thing only depends on Z. And the picture in hyperbolic space is the vertices are zero and one, zero and Z. The geodesics between points on the boundary are vertical semicircles. The geodesics joining these points to infinity go like that. And then there's one behind that you can't see. So you have such a, a tetrahedron, ideal tetrahedron, parameterized by a single complex number Z, which to be more, a little more precise is an element of C different from zero and one. So delta of Z. So now, if you think of a usual Riemann surface, you can triangulate it into triangles. And we, and we use that a lot in topology to define homology. So in the same way, M3, you can triangulate into a practically disjoint union of tetrahedra. They meet along their edges. You glue te tetrahedron along a common face, a common triangle, but otherwise they're disjoint. And then each one, because of what I just told you, each one has an associated number, which is its cross ratio. And so you get a bunch of numbers. And because of most of rigidity, these numbers are all algebraic. And so they all lie in a certain number field. And that's the definition essentially of F. It's the field that you get 
by adjoining to Q all of these so-called shape parameters. So these are the shape parameters because they describe the shape of the triangles at infinity. So therefore, what I didn't tell you here, but will now is that because hyperbolic space is a metric with constant negative curvature, constant curvature minus one, but this thing is a volume and it's finite because even though it goes to infinity, the integral of, of, of the thing converges and it's exactly given, that's the reason for the importance of that function, it's exactly given by the bloch wigner dilogarithm function. So therefore the volume of this thing is exactly the sum of the d of z i, which is by the formula already told you exactly d of xi m i, xi m, where xi m now, I told you that there will be an element of the block group. This xi will simply be the sum z i. But of course, in order to be in the block group, it has to satisfy this mysterious condition, sum z i wedge one minus z i is zero. And so the topology has to be such that the gluing conditions that these different things glue together to form a closed manifold forces the z i's not to be independent. That's by the way also the reason that they're automatically algebraic because you have so many equations, you have roughly n equations and n unknowns and it forces it to be rigid. They're exactly n solutions although that's not a complete proof. So why is that true? So last time when I talked about volumes, I mentioned that Thurston, I think around 1983, had discovered that the volumes of all three manifolds are well-ordered. So there's the smallest volume, second smallest, a third, and then they have the first limit point, and then there's the next smallest, and the next limit point, and then a third limit point, and the first limit point, and limit points, and so on. And in a paper of Walter Neumann and myself, in 1985, we studied, we wanted to know how quickly these volumes tend to the limit, and it's a nice result, it involves the dialogue. I don't want to say that, but to do that, almost the entire paper was devoted to one problem, and that was to describe the combinatorics of these numbers ZI. Once you have that under control, everything works. And the answer is, of course, it's topology, because we're talking about a three manifold. Oh, it didn't have to be a not complement yet for that. We're talking about a three manifold, but in the end, it leads to some very surprising uh, number theory, including a simpler definition of the block group. So what we found there, now it's kind of universally called the Norman Sagir equations. We find that there are two uh, matrices, n by n matrices over z. They satisfy condition that I'll say in one minute. And then what you have is that each of these say parameters You have that the product of z i to the a, sorry, a, z j to the a i j, it's matrix multiplication, j from one to n is equal, but sometimes there's a sign, which is a terrible nuisance, but that's how it is. Uh, here you have one minus z j. And since these are n by n matrices, this thing goes, i goes from one to n. So you see that this is a polynomial equation in n unknowns, but there are n of them, so n equations in n knowns typically a zero dimension, you get algebraic numbers, and that's what we're getting. But these are the equations, but not every A and B will do it. What it, the condition turns out to be, these are N by N matrices. There exist two more N by N matrices, A, B, C, D, such that this whole thing is an element of the symplectic group of two N by two N matrices with coefficients in Z. I'm not going to define the symplectic group it takes one minute, but it's, if you know it, you know it, and if not, it's completely pointless, it's just a simple definition. But the point is that these equations tell you that. And now when you look at the sum zi, which was my h, and you apply d of it, so that's the sum zi wedge one minus zi. And now you use these relations, they give you stacks of relations between the z's and the one minus z's, and you combine with the symplectic property, then you find that it's exactly set up so that this is zero. And in fact, we've developed this now a bit more and it turns out that there exists a completely nice description for any number field, now nothing to do with topology. There's a description of B of F of the block group of the field in terms of uh, these matrices. And we only need A and B because only A and B play a role, but the condition on A and B is that they're half of a symplectic matrix. So we call it the half symplectic description and the solution uh, Z Z1 up to Zn of these equations. So if you give yourself the top half of the symmetric 
uh, of the symplectic matrix over Z, and you give your, then you can write down these equations and you can solve them. And if you take a solution, which will be some algebraic numbers, then this sum Z I will be in the block group. You get all elements of the block group. And what's very pretty, uh, when you do this, remember to understand the block group, it's not enough to know that you're in the kernel of x wedge one minus x. That was the consequence of these and z equations. You also have to note that the five term relation won't hurt you. So let's look at the five term relation. It's something very familiar in triangulation in the topology. If this were a surface, you could do the following trick. You could take two adjacent triangles, remove the common edge and replace them by these two. But then you'd sort of be at the end of your rope because if you do it again, you go back. But when you do it for hyperbolic uh, with the uh, three dimensional things, then you can take a hyperbolic tetrahedron that's called the vertices A, B, C, and X. But then because it's, you know, they fought, fit together into a closed manifold, then this face cannot be there because there's no boundary. So there have to be another tetrahedron that shares that same face. Y, I, I drew this uh, poorly, it's gonna be hard to read. So we have Y. And so here are two adjacent tetrahedrons. Now, if I remove, uh, I just make the vertical line from X to Y, and here I take the edge BC and join it all up. I can't draw for beans, so I can't figure out how to do this. Uh, I, I made a mess, but you can see topologically it's correct, of course, because everything is correct topologically. So you take the tetrahedron, its four vertices are XB, XY, and BC, or XY and AB, or XY and AC, and you have divided up this thing into three. And therefore, you can take any two tetrahedron and change them into three. This is called the two three Pachner move. And it's a beautiful theorem that any two triangulations are related by this procedure. You always take two, do this, break them into three, and do it again hundreds of times up and down. And you can go from any triangulation to any other. Well, doing this has an effect on these Norman Zagier equations. And it's on the nose, although it takes some working out, it's on the nose, the five term relation. And therefore, if you go from one triangle triangulation to the other, you don't change the class of Xi M. So therefore this Xi M, which once again, is the sum of these shape parameters, you don't add the numbers, you add the formal things. This thing is in the block group of F. So we have elements in a very natural way in the block group that sort of arise for real life, and I told you this is highly computable, and the examples were if I took the 4, 1, not, so now I'm talking about not confluence, f there was q of squared of minus 3, and the xi was 2 times the sixth root of unity, which is kind of trivially in the block group, but if you took 5, 2, the field was q of xi, where xi cubed minus xi squared plus 1 is 0, so it's the field of discriminant minus 23, and now the element if I didn't get the numbers wrong, is this one. And you can equally check that that is in the block group. So these are very, very concrete things. And this means that there is a triangulation here with three triangles with these shape parameters and something about orientation to get a sign. Okay, so that's very concrete. And we get to this uh, abstract looking block group from a knot or from a three manifold. Now the other, I also explained last time, but I won't go into more detail, will associate to any knot, now it's only knots, not three manifolds, something called J. Well, now I told you that there's something called the Kashaif invariant, which is an element of Q of Z to N. Z to N is the standard nth root of unity. I won't write it again for all integers N. So if you have a knot, you get this, uh, this called the Kashaif invariant. He defined a sequence of numbers. But now Havero proved, I think I mentioned it last time, I'm not sure I wrote it out with year and so, I've forgotten, I think 2001, I've forgotten, uh, that there exists a completely, well, by what I told you here, it'll be unique because of the injectivity I mentioned, there's an element of the Habira ring, which is uniquely determined by the fact that this Kn for every n is Jk of z to n, where z to n again is the standard nth root of unity, e to the two pi i over n. Now you may say, hang on, before I told you that I needed the value of an element of the Habir ring in all roots of unity. And this is all roots of unity, of course, dense on the circle, they're all rational points, but now I only have uh, minus one, minus one, e to the two pi per third, four. I mean, I just have a small subset. 
but this thing has to be Galois invariant. And the Galois group sends every root of unity of order n to another, and it acts transitively on the primitive nth roots of unity. So if you know the value of, of an element at the standard roots of unity by Galois invariants, you know them all. So this completely fixes JK, but the fact that, it's, that it exists is very remarkable. And so again, this is completely explicit. I gave the formula last time for 4-1. I'll give it again, writing it very slightly differently. If k is 4-1, then this function jk of q is the infinite sum. But remember, it converges because in the sense of this inverse limit. And I'll write it slightly differently from what I did last time. You take qn that I just defined, 1 minus q up to 1 minus q to the n, the same with q inverse, and then that infinite sum will, is certainly in the Javier ring trivially, but this does give, uh, I'd say to n, the Kashaif invariant. So now we have uh, examples how the knots and the three manifolds give us elements in these rather sophisticated number theoretical gadgets. Let me just look at the notes to see if I dropped anything. Now I did drop something. In this case, we can both do, here's the order of Q. So remember, we're only talking about roots of unity and it's Galba invariant. So all I care is the order. And I'm going to leave a little space. If you're leaving notes, you also could, because there'll be one more line later if I don't forget. And so here's for the 4, 1 knot. And I actually gave you these values last time, but as real numbers, or as and I write them as polynomials in Q. So the first three, the first four, were integers anyway. So an integer is also a polynomial. Uh, but the next one, last time, was 46 plus 2 squared of 2. And now it's 44 minus 4Q squared minus 4Q cubed. So uh, if uh, that's a minus sign, not an equal sign. So Q here is the fifth root of unity. And so Q squared plus Q cubed belongs to the field Q squared of five. And it's just the number I told you last time. So you have this. So remember, the Habira ring, one way of looking is you give its values at roots of unity. But every root of unity has some order, one, two, three, four, five. Dot, the next one is 89. They're all well-defined. But we can also look at J41 of e to the minus h. And I gave you that one last time, too. It's a power series. It happens to be even because this knot is its own mirror image. It's 47 twelfths h to the fourth plus et cetera. So again, we see numbers mysteriously, miraculously coming out of the knot. Out of the same invariant, it's the same Kashaif invariant, which is this a priori meaningless infinite sum. It only makes sense when you can make it converge, which is either if Q is a root of unity or e to the minus h or a combination of root of unity times an infinitesimal power series deformation around that root of unity. So now we have certainly seen that knots are producing a lot. We saw it last time and I reviewed it now that a lot of number theory is showing up out of these things. So now I come to the next ingredient, which I said last time, but uh, much more briefly, and I want to say it a little better. I was also going to say something about Ptolemy coordinates for this, but I think I'll drop the Ptolemy coordinates. If somebody has heard of them and wants to know, they can say afterwards, what did Mr. Ptolemy do rather long ago? He didn't actually give coordinates for hyperbolic three manifolds. So, so the next story, which I talked about last time, is quantum modularity. So this was the conjecture that we even called it QMC, quantum modularity conjecture, which I gave in 2010, based on the you know, pictures, quantum modularity conjecture. So it said that for any knot, but let me make it very explicit. If I look at, for instance, J41 of one over N, sorry, I'm using two notations. I'm using J of Q, for a knot, which is in the Habira ring, but I'm also using an ordinary J, not script, of X, where X is a rational number or later slightly different, and they're related by this way. So for what I'm doing now, I want the function of X. So if I look at J at one over N, this is exactly J for one of zeta N, because that is E to the two pi. And this by the definition uh, is the original Kashaif invariant. And that's where Kashaif had his volume conjecture which was n to the three half. Well, he didn't know that. He just had the volume, volume over two pi times n. But actually then, remember, there was a whole power series. And this power series, this was a uh, calculation of many people, in particular, Sergei Gukov and collaborators, including me, but also Stavros Garufalidis and a different 
a collection of calculations with other collaborators. Uh, I wrote this several times last time. It's a power series whose first uh, two coefficients, well, the first one is one, the next two are 11 over 72 squared of minus three and 697 over two times 72 squared of minus three squared. In this particular case, they're all in the field Q of squared of minus three. In general, they would all be in F of H, except for this prefactor whose square is in F of H up to a root of unity. And that's what we think will always happen. But this and where H, so I didn't say what H was, I should have, but now I'll write it again. It's two pi I over N. So this whole thing I'll call the power series associated to four one of H. And here I evaluated the two pi I over N. This was the volume conjecture of Kashai very much refined to put in these things. But then as I told last time, if you let N be replaced by X, which might be a thousand plus a third. So X is still large and it is a very small denominator, but it's not an integer, it's an integer plus some, let's say some fixed amount. You'll have exactly the same X three halves E to the volume over two pi times X and the same power series on the nose to all orders at two pi I over X, except that that whole form is true to all orders up to a factor. And that factor is exactly the original J of X. And so you have a modular relation between J of X. In this case, I can put minus one over X because it's even, it looks better. And more generally, if I take J for one, and actually now I can put any knot, uh, the K actually I put upstairs. I should remember my notations. If you take any element of the modular group, A, A B, C, D, are integers with determinant one, you'll get the usual modularity factor that you'd expect. And then you'll get, I'll, I'll call this whole thing phi hat. I'm not gonna write it again, phi hat of H, which here is two pi I over X, will be the phi series multiplied by an exponential in one over H. So it's the completed power series. So here it'll be some completed power series, depending on the knot, of not two pi I over X anymore, but C times C X plus D. But this power series is not always the original one. This is the one when A over C is zero. So for the element minus one over X. But if you take some other element, you'll have other power series. So now I'm coming to the uh, actual content of the, you know, this new, well, not new anymore, several years uh, investigation. So what we find is that this quantum modularity gives us, but it's completely conjectural that it's true at all, but it gives us a collection of power series, phi alpha of H, all of which will belong conjecturally to Q bar double bracket H. And there's a lot of number theory about this that I went into a little bit last time. It's actually a power series with coefficients in, so alpha is a, a rational number. Uh, and then if I take the corresponding root of unity, this will actually be some prefactor, just a constant times uh, just power series in H with coefficients in that cyclotomic field. So, so there's a lot of arithmetic, not just one power series, but infinitely many, but even the existence of these was conjectural and we didn't know what they were. We just said there should be some series that you find on the computer to lots of terms. But then there were two papers in I think 2013 and 2018 by Dimofta, Tudor Dimofta, and again, Stavros Garofalidis uh, found a formula for phi. Now that doesn't mean that they, for all of the, well, first for phi zero in the first paper and then for all phi. So there's, it doesn't mean they proved the conjecture, but they wrote down a collection indexed by rational numbers of power series, which are completely well-defined by uh, using the triangulation, the Norman Sagir equation and so on. There, it's not actually proof that they're top lots of invariance, but it's believed, but in many cases, it's, you can check different triangulations but they gave an actual formula. So the conjecture which said before for some unknown power series, you have this asymptotic behavior, which I hope I didn't remove, the asymptotic behavior that J of gamma X is CX plus C to the three abs, J of X, I forgot this factor, and then times this power series. They tell you not just there's some power series, but this power series does it, and it always works. But now something very nice happens because these power series, have coefficients in the number field, you can, sorry, that's not Q. It's not at all Q. In our example, it was Q of square root of minus three. It's F, which is the trace field of the knot. The field that remember 
for the for one knot was q of square root of minus three, and for another knot it was q of xi to square root of 23. So you take that basic field, you join the root of unit you're looking at, and that's where the coefficients lie. So they gave a bunch of series, but now you don't just get phi alpha for the knot k, but you get sigma one, which is the original one, up to phi alpha k sigma r, where these are the different embeddings of the field, and they actually correspond to the parabolic flat connections. And sometimes, as I've mentioned, it's not a single field and its embeddings. It's an algebra. It could be a product of finite many fields. But don't worry. So you get a whole vector of size r. So remember, I gave the examples uh, for my favorite knots, uh, for the paper, it's the favorite knots. 2, 3, 7 pretzel is the last one. R was 2 here, R was 3 here, R was 6. So we had a quadratic field, a cubic field, and here are two distinct cubic fields. So because they gave a recipe for the series, but it's algebraic, you can automatically get all of the uh, perturbed ones. You get a whole vector of power series. But then uh, Stavros realized that you can add one more. So among the trivial flat connections, I haven't said exactly what they are, but among the parabolic flat connections, there's one called the trivial connection, sigma zero. And he realized that you should incorporate that one too. So that was his another uh, beautiful observation or realization. So if I do this for the four one knot, then remember this was the series one over the fourth root of three times one plus 11 H over, over whatever it was, 72 squared of minus three. And the next one has to be the conjugate. It's actually i over the fourth root of three. But then here it's one minus 11h, because you take the other embedding of q of squared of minus three. So it just happens in this case, it's kind of boring. It's simply phi, the original phi of minus h up to a root of unity. But now we don't just have two, we have three. And the third one is exactly, that was what he realized, what you have to put here is the series we saw before. It's the expansion of the Kashai invariant itself around one or more generally around alpha. So this one would be exactly this Kashai invariant evaluated at zeta, which remembers e to the two pi alpha times e to the minus h. So if zeta is one, it was this for that special knot. So this was, this example is when the knot is the simplest knot, figure eight, and when alpha is zero, but we have you know, stacks of these things for other knots and for other alphas. So you get a whole vector. And so now there's, maybe I'll stop talking for 30 seconds so you can catch your breath. I'll have a sip of water. Now comes the kind of key point that led to this whole uh, thing that I told you very briefly at the end of the last lecture. So first of all, Oh, I'll ask Marco to show us the slides again. What I told you last time is that this function j of x uh, is periodic, so you can draw pictures. Maybe you show us again slide one. And what you get is this weird thing, kind of a cloud of points going off to infinity with a lot of internal structure, but it's certainly not a function on the real line because this x is periodic. So you see all of these points, it goes from zero to one and then it starts again and repeats periodically. But if you take, uh, instead, the ratio of j, for instance, j of minus one over x divided by j of x, then roughly you're getting this, except there's some little fuzzy. So if we go to picture two, which I showed last time, just to remind you what happened, then we got a function that at least became a function of a real variable, but wasn't a smooth function, but, but kind of a function with jumps at all rational points. So this modularity led to something very concrete, but completely mysterious. And I already told you the solution last time, the very last minute, that actually there's a whole vector of power series, as I just wrote, but actually this vector is going to be part of a whole matrix. So I'll, uh, I'll first tell you that. So there's going to be a matrix. Phi alpha, I'll always use underline uh, for these. So all of these were power series. And this matrix in general will be R plus one by R plus one. It's this number point, it's a, it's a real number. Uh, 0, 0, 0005445041, 4, 0, 4, and that's all the, but it's not like there, of course, these you could make as many digits as you want. It's an exact number. That's this side. But here you say, I would like to write down something else and say what this is, but it doesn't make sense because this thing is e to the volume times 100, roughly normalized to some huge number, and then times this power series, 1 plus 11 
over 72 squared of minus three times two pi i over 100. But this series, although the first coefficient is one and the next one is much smaller, but after a while the coefficients uh, blow up because the nth coefficient grows like n factorial. So it doesn't make sense. But now we can remove this, we can replace this thing by the same number and we do, uh, tr we truncate. So if you have such a power series, a and h to the n, and the a's are too big to make it converge. So a n grows, let's say, like n factorial or some constant at the end. Then this series always diverges. But if you stop n from zero to uh, the, the optimal term here, I think is, uh, what is it? It's roughly e to the, uh, it should be one, or, uh, one over h times c, I think. Let's say you stop it roughly, of course, you have to round up or round down. But if you take the right number of terms, notice the terms at the beginning, the first one is one, the second is much smaller, the second is yet much smaller. At some point, they're exponentially small, and then they start going up. So you just stop, like you do in perturbative field theory, when you calculate you know, fine structure constants and things. You just stop the series when the stopping is good. And we'll call that phi of h optimal truncation, optimal. So that's a well-defined number. It's not completely well-defined in the sense you have to get your algorithm exactly where you stop. But, but if you do this here, it works. And so I've written down that number two. So you can do this. And the amazing thing is if you just took the power series, you could only get like eight coefficients. And you say, okay, I get eight, one, nine, eight, five, one, eight, eight, I'm pretty happy. But now this thing is a well-defined number. And so I can compute it. And here it is. As you see, I'm doing pretty well so far. So at this point, you might well say, ah, it's simply equality, as Samir asked yesterday, but it can't really be equality because this thing, I stopped at some point, threw away the next term. So what actually happens is that, but the next, but what I'm going to write now, you can't see the 4141 anyway, so I'll just remove it and put a few fewer digits. This thing, you can still make sense up to about 12 digits beyond the decimal, because the optimal truncation is not exact, but the thing you're throwing away is exponentially small, but it's multiplied by something exponentially big, but the difference is still very small. Here's like 10 to the minus 12. So now it makes sense to talk about the difference, and you immediately see that the difference isn't zero, because this precision is 12 digits, but it's already off in the, in the ones place. So it's not exactly equal, but when you compute it, you find that the difference is 1.00401114185, roughly. And you can't get more digits because the optimal truncation procedure is approximate, but it does give you roughly 11 digits. So if you look at this, you say, well, that's not a random number. It's very near to one. So let's change 100 to 200. And then this goes to roughly 0 0.002. And if you interpolate, uh, sorry, 001, in fact, it's like one over n squared. What you find is that the difference, if this is h, you know, is exactly, I, we interpolated this, this standard algorithm. And when you do this, what you find is that this difference is a power series in h, and it's exactly one minus h squared plus 47 twelfths h to the fourth. It's exactly the one that we already saw, which we now have decided is going to be the top element of this matrix. So now you have something really kind of surprising you have that the value of j of one over n, let me put it on the left, uh, minus this uh, truncation, two pi i over n, but it doesn't have to be even an integer, it can have a denominator. So here I'll put j of x. So you find that much, that was the original conjecture, but now when you do it again, you find that you always get the, this j, evaluated at zeta, which is e to the two pi i a over c times e to the minus h, but multiplied by something that something here is always one. So to, but it's still not exact because we've still subtracted something approximate, but now we've got a second term. So now it's beginning to look very different. It's not a multilinearity statement anymore. It's an expansion of one term, which is the product of one of our phi hat series. Remember that was the, the middle one of the three and then a coefficient j of x, which is periodic. Then here we have this one, which I told you is the top one. And, uh, and it also has a periodic coefficient, which happens to be one. However, we should have a third one because we should have, remember the third series in this case, 
with simply minus two pi i over x. We know that. We know that we have three series. But this one is exponentially big. If this was 10 to the 20, this is 10 to the minus 20. It's too small. However, we were able to improve this process of optimal truncation to a new one called smooth optimal truncation. It's quite amusing. I could give a whole talk about that. It's a fun thing, completely well-defined numerical procedure. You can't improve arbitrarily, but you can improve the exponential degree of approximation by a considerable factor. And the result is when you do this with smooth, instead of optimal, you get like 30, 40 digits that are reliable instead of only 12. And so now you can compare that with this, which is also divergent, but you do it the same way with optimal. And you find that there's a third difference. When you subtract the big term and the middle term, there's a small term. And that was indeed exactly the other series to all orders. And it's multiplied by a new numerical coefficient. And so when you do this, you find that you have a new function. But this function was j of x. This one happened to be constant. This is a new function, q of x. And it turns out that this q of x, or, or rather the q of x, if I translate it into e to the 2 pi i x, then this element, again, is in the Habira ring. And that you can check by these Olbsky congruences that I mentioned, or in this case, we could write down an actual formula. So, okay, so this is where these matrices came from. You see there's no kind of choice when you do this, your computer tells you there's this term, this, but now you might think now it goes on forever, but no, now this is, it stops. And what's more, now you can put these new series like Q, replace J by Q and find the new multivariety, and you find that you get new series. But the new series after a while, they're in the case of four one, they're exactly, well, we already had three, so it's only three new ones, but you fill up the whole matrix and then the thing stops, it closes up. And now, it has a very simple interpretation because this matrix now, one column is one zero zero. This is the Habera run, you know, the J, this was this Q. This is the original phi and some other phi and some other phi and some other phi. But if you multiply two such matrices, then each entry, when you multiply matrices, you have a sum of three terms, this times this times that. And that is these three terms. And so this thing can now be interpreted as the final version what we call the refined quantum modularity conjecture, it says that this matrix valued invariant, uh, I'm underlining the member for the matrix. Now, if I put AX plus B over CX plus D and divide by CX plus D to the three halves, I'll slightly lie to keep the formula simpler. Then this is simply the product, uh, I forget if it's on the right or the left, of 5X as a matrix times this uh, J-like thing, which is periodic. So it's, uh, sorry, this is the matrix, but this is evaluated at A over C times another phi, which is at zeta E to the H, where H is, is what it was before, two pi I. The details of the formulas don't matter. Don't even try to follow it. But, and zeta was E to the two pi I A over C. So I, I messed this up slightly, but the point is that the thing turns into a product of two matrices have a formula to all orders. And so now let me come uh, cut to the chase, as they say, and say what this has given us. So you can do this for every element gamma of the SL2Z and for every knot. And we will get a single object we call W gamma, which I should take out my notes so I don't get completely bollocked up with the notations, but I do anyway. Uh, yeah, we're going to get a single function, W gamma of X, and this will be a cosine, it's a matrix, R plus one by R plus one matrix, depending originally on gamma and on X, but it's a cocycle because this X maybe is a rational number. And then what you have is that W gamma gamma prime of X, I should get the order right, is W gamma of gamma prime X times W gamma prime of X. So that's called the co-cycle. And the reason that it's a co-cycle is that it's given, so to speak, to all orders. You interpret all of these things as this new Habero-like function, but only the top things will be in the usual Habera ring. The other elements are going to be in these new Habera rings of the other number fields, the F1 up to FR. But whatever it is, we'll have a new J, which is a matrix valued thing. 
And that makes sense for everybody. And W gamma of X will just be J of gamma X inverse times J of X. So if you know even a little cohomology, you'll say, ah, oh, it's a very boring cohomology class because it's a cosine, but this says that it's a co-boundary. But it's not because this co-boundary, that's the one we saw on this slide, the function that jumped all around. It's a terrible mess. So this here, it's a co-boundary in the space of functions whose graph is just a mess. But this is the surprise. Maybe we can look again at slide, the last slide, slide four. This is the function which when K was four one and gamma was, zero minus one, one, zero. This, can I have slide four, please? Marco? No. Uh, you saw it last time, but I want to show you again. No, slide four, yeah. There, this W gamma still has, for four, one, it is nine entries, three of them are trivial, but these three are not trivial. They happen to be real up to powers, or, or I times real, so taking the real part. Uh, and now suddenly all of the functions become smooth. So this now becomes a co-cycle in uh, C infinity of R, uh, well, actually of R, uh, and then it's actually is determinant one. So it's an R by R matrix, R plus one by R plus one matrix, whose coefficients suddenly have lifted from meaningless power series to or functions only defined at rational numbers but jumping all over the place, suddenly it lifts to a function on R. And this was a big, very, very big surprise and kind of the, the main part that came out of this and you see it visually or you saw it a second ago visually in that picture. So now um, my time is uh, nearly up. I mean, we started certainly a few minutes after 4.30 and I think I can go on a little. So I'll take a, a few minutes, but very few to tell you the other side of the story. So what happens with this function? So it is all of these uh, properties that I've already written. So what we found, well, what we already found is that just by these numerical computations, like even for 4.1, we started with this J41 of X that we already knew that I gave you the formula, Q minus one N, QN. But then we had this power series phi, and then the second one was, as it happened, five minus H for this case. But then we had another phi star of H that I didn't actually show you, but very similar coefficients. And here there was another I called the Q of, uh, Q of X. And it turned out that you can find the formula for that Q is e to the two pi I X always. And this one turns out to be the same Q inverse N times Q N, but multiplied by one half of Q to the N plus one minus Q to the minus N minus one. That's kind of surprising. It's the same kind of thing. And so this I'll say very briefly for every knot we found it's most almost everything is conjectural by, by this point, that you have the original Habira ring, which remember is a limit of polynomials. So you can write it's an infinite sum of polynomials in Q, which where the nth one is divisible by Pochhammer. And this is a similar thing, but you insert here a polynomial in Q and Q to the N, a Laurent polynomial, but a fixed one, independent of N. And when you do that, you can, of course, insert infinitely many polynomials, but because of the recursions, because of the property of the Pockhammer symbol, if you take all polynomials in Q and Q to the N here, then all of these functions span a finite dimensional module. Here it's got rank three. And that rank three module has, contains one, it contains this, it contains this, and this is actually a basis. And so this is called the Q holonomic structure. It was very surprising. And then the same thing is true for these power series. So this one here, so there are infinitely many things if I put Q to the N, Q to the two N, Q to the three N, Q to the minus N, but there are any three of them are linearly dependent. And so I can take linear combinations and there are only three independent ones, but there's not really a canonical basis. But then these experiments show there is a canonical base. We don't know how to define it a priori, which is given by the, by the coefficients of this matrix. So one of the things that came out of this analysis was new elements of the Habir ring, also, these other power series, uh, they're also, you can describe a, per, a posteriori by the Dimov to Garofalidis algorithm. But then the, another very nice thing is that there's a holomorphic structure. These functions are not just in C infinity of R, but away from, at zero, they, they have to be divergent because around zero, they have a power series expansion. And that's these series, which we know are factorially divergent. So they can't be analytic, but it turns out that they are analytic. So C omega, 
on the R star. So these graphs that you saw a minute ago in graph four, at the origin, you can't see with the naked eye, there's C infinity, but everywhere else is actually real analytic. And that you can test, because from these formulas, we get closed formulas for the power series of this at every point. And at zero, it's divergent. You look at the hundredth coefficient, it's, it's got a 50 digits. But if you take some other point, it's a convergent power series, and the hundredth coefficient is 0 0.01 or something. I have all of the numbers there. I can't go into time to show you. So you can test purely numerically, but we, by that time, knew had to be true, which is that these series, which were originally divergent power series, in particular, each phi of alpha, like the original one, phi of h is now the Taylor series but it happens to be divergent because that point is not analytic, the Taylor series at h equals zero of, an, of a function, which I'll still call phi of h because it's the same function, so to speak, but which is analytic uh, away from zero. So you have a function which is smooth everywhere, but at zero, it has a power series expansion that, that's divergent because it's it's not analytic, so the Taylor series can diverge, but at all other points, the Taylor series, it's smooth, but the Taylor series would have a finite radius convergence up to some near singularity. So we have this holomorphic behavior. And so now I come to the very last part of the talk. The time is running out. It's actually a second paper, but a much simpler one that is the companion to this, and much simpler ones once understood the first one. And that's, so this, the last topic, is from Knott's, from knots to Q series. So by Q series, I'll just mean some sum, you know, A and Q to the N, typically for me, always in fact, with coefficients of Q, but now convergent for Q less than one. So if I think of this as a function of tau, F of tau, where Q is always in the theory of multiple forms is E to the two pi I tau, tau is in the upper half plane. So I get functions that are now defined in the upper half plane, which is completely different from what I had before. I had functions at the rational numbers, which are kind of disjoint from the upper half plane. It's a subset of the reals. And so we had no reason to think that there would be Q series associated to knots. And I'll tell very briefly, I've told it often in lectures, so some of you may have heard it, the story of how they, we found this. It's kind of very amusing because it shows how you can discover things exactly when you don't know what you're doing. So in work of uh, Garofalidis on what's called the stability of the coefficients of the evaluation of the regular quantum spin network is nothing to do with topology or knots. He found a certain series, which I'll write down, G of Q, which you can write in many ways, but it's the Pochhammer symbol we had, Q infinity, times the sum from zero to infinity, minus one to the N, Q to the power three n squared plus n over two divided by Q n cubed. Okay, so it's just some series. So this is what I mean by Q series. And this particular kind is what's called a hyper Q hypergeometric series. And maybe I should mention that this kind of series where you have Q with or without a sign, Q to a quadratic form divided by something with Pochhammer symbols, that's a very common class and a specific class of those are called nam sums after Werner nam. And Nam had a beautiful conjecture for many years that said that those things are occasionally modular. The Rogers Ramanujan example was the most famous example, but they can only be modular if some element of the block group that he defined was a torsion element. And nobody ever thought of relating these things to the block group, which is a very esoteric thing. And uh, five years ago, because of the paper with Garofalidis and Caligari on these units that I talked last time, we actually proved his conjecture about modularity. So roughly, the conjecture says, if something is supposed to be a true modular form, which it might be, that can only happen if the element of the block group is zero. But that can only happen if the volume is zero. So for hyperbolic manifolds, this will never be modular. So this, you don't want it to be modular. It can't be modular. It's impossible. So this is not a modular function, but that doesn't mean, uh, sorry, I wanted this as a function of tau. we again, Q. No, this was called G of Q. But let's call it, OK, let's think of it as a function of, of tau. So now uh, we looked at this, and so he wanted to know the asymptotics when Q went to one. And so he asked me if I could do that numerically because we have good numerical methods. And after a lot of work, we found that G of E to the two pi I tau, when tau tends to zero, so here's zero in the upper half plane, so you come, let's say, vertically, it was very hard to do because it oscillates 
And it's very hard to recognize oscillatory things if you don't realize a certain trick that we only realized a year later, then it's very easy. But what you find after a lot of numerical work is exactly that to all orders, this function is the difference of the same power series I've been talking the whole time with the one, the 11, 697 over two. And it's so to speak, the odd part of that. And we found this completely numerically. We didn't know, we just studied this numerically. It oscillated, but the oscillatory thing, there's a rotation by I, so it was an exponential term, turned out to be exactly the number 0 0.326. And Stavros recognized, he said, wait a second, that's the volume of the 4-1 knot. This had nothing to do with knot theory. And then I, we found the coefficients, and the, the second coefficient was the 697. And I remembered that we had seen the 697 somewhere, and it was exactly the 697 we've been seeing. So in other words, these things that come from the 4-1 knot were related to this G, which came from somewhere else. But it means that somehow the 4-1 knot has to know about this Q series it gives it. But there should be two, and so we looked for a long time to find two, and it turns out that there's a second one. I won't write the formula, but it's similar. It's completely explicit. So we have two functions. So the 4, 1 knot, the story is for every knot, but let's think 4, 1, gives me two knots, two series. We call them simply little g and big g, both of which are given by this kind of Q hypergeometric series. So by very explicit formula, and I gave you the first coefficients of... Uh, little g, and maybe I can give you a couple of capital G if I can see where they're written down. So here I told you this starts one well, month. You are, you are remembering the time, right? Sorry? You remember the time? Oh, you know? sorry. Time. Then I'll just tell you in one minute. Okay, less than a minute, 30 seconds. I thought I still had five minutes because I'm very optimistic about time. So we found after some work, there are two power series. And now they have an amazing relation with each other, which is that each of these is completely divergent outside of the unit circle. So if you think of them as a function of tau in the upper half plane, they have the whole line. So let me put g of tau instead of, it's the same function. In, but if you take minus one over tau, and then there's a factor, I think tau or something like that. And here you take minus one over tau g of tau, this function and this function and this function and this function are defined in the upper half plane and they're singular at every point. They have a line to same singularities. But this one is analytic. In the cut plane, you have the upper half plane and the lower half plane, you have to cut from zero to infinity, but it extends holomorphically across the real axis. And so just to say the final sentence, it turns out there's a huge class of such functions. We now call them holomorphic quantum multiple forms. Uh, in general, it's matrix value. This is matrix, one coefficient of a matrix. But the final statement is that these invariants that I'm defining can extend to holomorphic quantum multiple forms, which are functions that are suddenly not defined at roots of unity or just as power series uh, uh, perturbational, but they're actual holomorphic functions of the upper half plane. And they have a quantum uh, modularity property, but it's completely different from ordinary multiple forms. You don't have that the function at tau and the function at minus one over tau are related, but what you have is that the discrepancy, the difference, is the function that suddenly is holomorphic in a much bigger region. So I'm sorry I went on the amount of material. I told it's a 96-page paper, and even leaving out everything, there's still too much left. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's a very beautiful uh, lecture combining as uh, we said before, we have here geometry, topology, number theory, even analysis, everything. So 10 minutes more for combining all these beautiful things together. I think it was a very good, uh, <laughs> it's very nice that you opened this uh, series of uh, uh, consortium uh, lectures. And I must uh, say that even though Zoom usually is not our preferred uh, media, but the way that you talked on a, on a, on a blackboard with an audience and just getting photographed that is really, it almost felt that I'm in the, in the hall, in the hall where you are, uh, where you are talking. So this is, uh, so this is very nice. And um, I opened the floor for questions. If anybody has a question, then you can put it in the chat or just uh, wave your hand or something. Uh, it's not so easy. Yeah. 
No, I yeah. think nobody is muted. If they want, they can just ask. I was told they can turn on their microphone and just speak. Okay, okay, fine. So uh, unmute yourself and uh, and ask a question. No, yeah, usually uh, if two people unmute themselves, we'll manage it. So uh, any any question? Well, you have this uh, way to put to take difficult things and make them look simple. <laughs> I have, I'm afraid I did the opposite today because oh. uh, I was uh, too too rushed a little. So I'm afraid some things must have been quite incomprehensible. But I hope there are uh, some questions, maybe something that I could elaborate yeah. a little more. What what's yeah, the I, what's the next question? I mean, if anybody else, that's okay. What's I, the I have a I, I have a question. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, how does this invariance behave with respect to finite covers? Let's say you take a you take a figure eight, you take a finite cover, you have another hyperbolic manifold. Are there any interesting relations between the invariance of the or is it trivial or what? You've done it again. Last time you asked a very interesting question that I'd never thought of. And now you asked another very interesting question that I never thought of. I will ask Stavros if he can see anything. We have experimental data in great detail, but it takes months to get it for each knot, for the three knots I mentioned. I don't even know how to write down. Uh, you could, I guess, get triangulations just by repeating the, uh, take the inverse of the given triangulation. So if it's a double cover, you, you can take twice, twice the number of triangles and glue together. It may be that there's a simple answer to your question, but to be honest, I'm a little ashamed. I never thought of it. I have no idea. I will certainly tell Stavros, I don't know if he's listening, but he'll, I'll certainly talk to him tomorrow, whether he sees whether there is such a relation. It's an extremely reasonable question, and I have no idea. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, yes, I have a question. Yeah, Don, you have this series uh, small g and capital G, yeah? With integer coefficients, but uh, uh, will you have actually a kind of like, Integers depending on two uh, on uh, two entries uh, of your uh, like uh, uh, two uh, elements from R plus one element set like entry in your matrix and some integer. Well, thank you. That's uh, I was in principle going to say that. So this is what we found originally: the little g from the experiment I told you, and then big G. But if you look at this, you see little g, big g, little g, big g. It looks like a bilinear expression, but actually. It's just a straight product, but it's a product of matrices. Because let me call again G tar of bar of tau. Now it's only the two by two part. The top part we don't know how to do it, the extra row. But here you put G of tau or G of Q. Here you put G of Q. And here there are two others that we found later that belong to a Q homonomic system, just like I explained before. So for instance, if you remember how I went from the first element, you don't have to remember, I think it's still written. From the one element of the Habira ring to the next, you just insert a Q to the n plus one. Then if I remember correctly, this is exactly the same. I simply insert here uh, one half of Q to the n plus one minus Q to the minus n minus one. It's essentially that, it might not be exactly. So you get actually infinitely many functions, G, G1, G2, but again, they satisfy recursion. They form a Q homonomic system. It's a finite rank here of rank two, and there's a canonical basis or fairly canonical. It's not quite this. So we actually have four series. And now once you have this, then you see that the previous statement is again, uh, if I take this function at tau, which means at Q and at minus one over tau and multiply, when you multiply two matrices, the upper left-hand entry is this one times that one. These two here are very, I don't want to get it, try to get it exactly right. This is just one entry of the product, but this whole thing suddenly goes into, it's a two by two matrix of determinant one in holomorphic functions in C prime, which is C minus the negative axis. So this quantum modularity is not about two functions, it's about R plus one by R plus one functions, the whole matrix. And the statement is much simpler. And what's more, it's not just this. It's for any gamma, except the, this, the, this will change very slightly. It's a different C prime. So you get this. And each of these functions, each G, is only defined in the upper half plane, actually upper and lower. They do not extend at all. 
But now you can make this, and it's the same story as before. So you make a co-cycle. This co-cycle is, of course, a co-cycle because in the upper half plane, it's a co-boundary. It's just a function of tau minus or divided by. But this function is the one that's holomorphic here. This function isn't. So this becomes a non-trivial co-cycle in this. And now the, this is the holomorphic one. It's exactly analogous to the other. But now comes the wonderful thing that's the culmination of the whole thing. It's not exactly analogous to the other. It's equal to the one I gave before, coming from the Habiro invariance and the perturbative invariance, is the same co-cycle at the end as you get. So it's like in motives, you can realize the same motive by very different objects, but at the end, it has the same underlying properties and different avatars, different manifestations of it. It's the same here, we have one co-cycle, and that's the basic invariant of the knot, is this co-cycle, gamma goes to W gamma. So it's a co-cycle, all together with coefficients of SL2Z in coefficients uh, uh, SLR plus one, of holomorphic functions. So we get a single co-cycle. That's the final invariant. It's a unique object, but it becomes a co-boundary in two related worlds, the world of holomorphic functions in the upper half plane and the, way, the world of functions on the rational numbers or with asymptotic expansions near all rational numbers. And then somehow they fit together in this rather uh, surprising way. So it's the same W at the end. And this is just one term of that expansion. So indeed, you, you were right that it's a whole R plus one story, not just two functions at random. So okay, thanks thank for the chance to say that, because that's the end of the story, that the same function comes from two completely different worlds, from this world of perturbative things around infinity or around rational numbers, and this thing from two series with integer coefficients. Okay. Any other question? I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so if you have partner move, moves in principle in any dimension, so for example, in four dimensions, Wait, we have- I can a, hardly hear. In four dimensions, we have three, three move, partner move. Is there, is there some natural generalization of block group, which involves something like six, six term relation or some something like that? I can see you, but I can't hear you very well. Okay, but I don't know what generalization is this with the six term relation, I'm, I'm not aware. So you should tell me privately because I certainly can't answer no, since I, I've never heard of that's, this. That's my question. Is, it, is, is there some natural, known natural generalization? Is there a known? Is, is there some known generalization? Of the block group? Yes, there's something called higher block groups, which I know very well because I invented them for 35 years ago, also experimentally, completely conjecturally. But you can write down uh, block groups depending on the number M and the original one, the B1 is kind of trivial, B2 is the original one. And these higher block groups have a regulator. And remember from my last lecture, this is related to zeta f of two, and these are related to zeta f of m conjecturally. And some part of that was proved for m equals three a few years later by Sasha Goncharov. And about three or four years ago, the case m equals four have been done. There's a huge number of a huge activity trying to prove those old conjectures. And the conjecture is that these groups, which have a fairly explicit description, should be isomorphic to higher K groups. But there's, so if M is two, you get K3, and that's connected with three-dimensional hyperbolic geometry. But they are not directly connected in the same way with higher dimensional hyperbolic geometry. And also you don't have the rigidity theorems, so and you don't, the arithmetic doesn't work the same way. So I think the passage from number theory to positive to number theory fails. But on the number theory side, there is indeed a series of higher ones. Uh, by the way, you said maybe six term. I thought you meant you knew one. The next one's A to three. Gonchar found the what we believe is the unique defining relation. It's a 22 term relation. Uh, so it's much, much more complicated, but that's not how you do it. You do it in a, a different way, and then you can work out the relations after. So there are indeed higher block groups, which are also defined by combinations of numbers satisfying some condition and multiple sum relations. And they're conjecturally equal to the higher K groups. And then by Borel's famous theorem that the Borel regulator of K theory gives you the value of the zeta function, that it can zeta function at M, we believe uh, here, this will be with the poly, not the dialogue, but the nth polylogarithm. And that's, you can check on the computer. And I wrote a paper many years ago, checking it up to M equals 17. So the 35th K group for a field of mm -hmm. with Antti Cohen and, and Lewin. And so, so it's been checked, we know it's true, but, but uh, except for M equals three and four, we don't know anything in those cases are extremely difficult already. 
So yes, there is a beautiful story, but it's not really connected with geometry yet, as far as I know. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Wonderful questions. The questions are better than the lecture. <laughs> Okay, if there are no more questions, I, before I'm thanking again the speaker, I want to thank the staff at ICTP and in UM for doing a wonderful job to put this together with a live audience and, and virtual audience. And it was a very good experience. So thank you very much, everybody. And thank you very much, uh, Don, for this uh, beautiful uh, lecture and time invested, etc. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank Don. You. Thank you very much. Thank so we you. have an hour, another lecture on Monday at 11 a.m. Miami time. Thank you. And yeah, the, uh, on Monday and Tuesday, 9 a.m. No, 11, 11 a.m. 11 a.m. Miami time. Yeah, Miami. at 11 a.m. Ah, it was changed to 11? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, because I thought it was changed to 9. Yeah. Okay, so Monday and Tuesday, both at 11 o'clock. Yeah. Adi Parasito will give the second consortium series of lectures. So you are all welcome. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Bye, Mina.